Hey everybody, this is Rob Dukes. Welcome to the Put Up Your Dukes podcast. I am uh, sitting here talking to you from my uh, backyard in lovely Ahwatukee, Arizona. Kind of near Chandler, Gilbert kind of area, kind of east. Um, it's a beautiful night here in Arizona. It's probably about 75 degrees. A, bright, a little windy, but it's fucking awesome. Um, I'm smoking... A cigar given to me by my buddy Barry, who works over at uh, at uh, Leaf by Oscar, and he uh, sent me, gave me a couple cigars to smoke. This is the uh, Ciceron. This is a really good cigar. Uh, it's kind of a mild cigar. It's not too heavy, not too light, but it's uh, right in the middle there. It's very good. Uh, today was a fucking amazing day. So, um... My guest was uh, Mr. Sean Avery, uh, formerly of the New York Rangers. He was uh, one of the most hated hockey players to ever play the game when he played. Um, he wasn't as hated as, as uh, Gary Bettman. Um, <clears throat> we had this awesome conversation about hockey and about life and about music. And, uh, you know, we, our music tastes are, are uh, very different, but he, uh, we both are a huge fan of the band Tool. So that was we had in common, System of the Down, and uh, we both have been to Coachella and, and other music festivals, and um, uh, he was just a very cool guy. Uh, I liked him a lot. Um, met him years ago, and then we've always kind of like stayed in touch, uh, you know, through like uh, social media, and, uh, but um, if you guys know me, you might, that I was, uh, he was my favorite hockey player to ever play the game. He was my favorite Ranger. And uh, it was fucking rad to just sit down and have a conversation with him. Uh, I wore his jersey on stage and got spit on for it. It was awesome. Um, I, uh, you know, I just, uh, I enjoyed the guy uh, a lot. So watching him play hockey, he was always just a fucking wrecking ball and a maniac. And uh, that's the way I wanted to be on stage. I mean, I, I, you know, when you're on stage, there's a little bit of a character going on. And he, in his book... Which, if you're a fan of, uh, a, like, a, a story that, I mean, he comes from, he's 5'10", 190 pounds. And at the time when he played hockey, dudes were 6'2", 230. And he played in a real big league uh, from the era that he played. And <clears throat> everyone his whole life told him he wasn't going to fucking make it. And he made it all the way to the NHL. And, um... You know, he's an inspiration. His book, uh, Ice Capades, is one of the best books uh, I've ever read as far as, like, an autobiography. That's a good book. Another good book I'd, I'd like you guys to read is called The Bronx Zoo. It's about the New York Yankees when they won the uh, World Series. And it does. it's not a book about the Yankees. It's a book about getting, like, pulling back the curtain. Like I did with the X's DVD when I showed people stuff that they had no business seeing. That's what Sean did to hockey, and what Sparky Lyle did for baseball was this book, and it's very funny, very, very well written, and uh, you know, I had a, a really cool uh, conversation with him. And uh, you but know. you know, that being said, he was my favorite hockey player, and uh, so uh, I moved into a new house, um, and uh, it was been a long few weeks, uh, still not even unpacked. Going through all my EXO merch, I got a, a, some stuff I'm going to put on eBay. Uh, I'll let you guys know all about that so you can have first dibs. Um, and a lot of cool stuff, man. Stuff that I like, holy shit, I know I have this. Uh, anyway, um, I talked about the, the lady serving cupcakes to the kids in her school with her husband's load in it. And... Um, I said that I don't want her on the planet. And then I thought about it more, and I, I, uh, I have no regrets about that statement. I no longer, I do not want her on this planet. I hope they uh, put her away forever. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to get to it. I don't really have a lot to say. I'm actually uh, I'm going to go see my mom, so I'm getting on a plane in a little bit. Uh, I hope you really, like, this is, we talked for about an hour and a half, and um, it, to me it was never boring, not for one moment. Um, 
So uh, Sean also has a podcast called uh, No Gruffs Given. And he's a very opinionated guy. He's a very intelligent guy. Um, his podcast, is, to me, is very funny. And, uh, and I like listening to it. He, he talks hockey. And he talks, uh, you know, New York. And he talks L.A. And he's, a, he's just a... He talks fashion and he talks every. He's he's just a man of. He's like a he's a man of the world and he's awesome. Oh, yeah. So yeah, he's on he's on cameo he's on cameo also, and I I've seen his cameos and they're fucking so good, they are fucking great. Way better than mine. I try mine are funny. I try to make mine funny, but Sean goes like he's like one step above. Man, he's his cameos are awesome. So if you can uh, get his can you know get a cameo from him. Um, once again, if you get a cameo from me. All the money goes to NHL uh, Hockey Fights Cancer. Um, you know, it goes to a good cause. So, you know, go ahead and do that if you want. Um, you know, I've done a few, and they're and they're they're pretty cool, man. They're pretty cool to, uh, to do for a friend. Um, if you give me all this information, I can really kind of uh, fuck with them too. You know. So, with that, here's my conversation with the Mr. Sean Avery. Sean fucking Avery. What's up, brother? How are you? Good, man. How are you? Good man. <laughs> so, uh, are you aware that I uh, wore your jersey on stage for about a year and a half? I wore that was my stage attire, and I used to get so much shit in Toronto. People were actually spitting on me for wearing your jersey during the playoffs. I, I believe that. Well, I appreciate the resilience to keep it going, um, but. Yeah, I've seen pictures of it. I've seen pictures of it, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, uh, this is the first time we've ever got to talk, so it's long overdue. Yes. Um, so I've read your book a couple times, and you know, most of my fans, the metalheads that watch this, aren't aren't going to know who you are. So I'm going to ask you questions that kind of go through the the story of how your life began. Yeah. Um, and I know that you know you're from uh, you're from Canada, so hockey is like uh, it's an everyday thing. Yeah. When you were, you started skating around five, correct? Yeah. 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 And you wanted to be an NHL hockey player. Now, were you groomed that way as far as like where they put hockey before education? Were you one of those outliers that, that the scouts saw you real young and said, this kid can play? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Uh, it's funny. Like, if you had to use the word groomed, Two years ago, I would have been like, oh, that's not a, that's not, it wouldn't have made me think, right? Right. But obviously, we're living in a fucking crazy time, and the, the word groomed is like a, a very topical, very topical word right now. But I think it can also, when you think about it, it, it can be, it can be used in a sort of a, an advantageous sense, and it, when you think like, okay, so yeah, I grew up in Canada. Hockey's our national sport. Um, actually, lacrosse, I think, is our national sport or the, the first sport, but hockey's the national sport, really. Um, my dad played. My dad played major junior in Oshawa, which was the same major junior league that I eventually ended up playing in. Um, my dad wasn't the type of parent that groomed, you know, I think he was the type of parent that does the right thing, which is sort of leads his kid in a direction. And if he, his kid takes to it, he kind of gives him every opportunity to, to take advantage of that. Um, we, you know, I guess like in phys ed, in, in public school, in, in like grades one through six, we play hockey as an intramural sport, right? It's not like basketball or baseball because it's cold outside. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think the culture sort of lends to, you know, eventually, I, I think everyone knows how to skate in Canada. You know, even, even, even guys that are computer programmers, because you, you do it when you're younger. I think that at a certain age, it got really sticky for me. And I was like, oh, this is all I want to do. Right. Um, were your parents totally on board with you? Like, uh, were they completely behind you in every sense? You know, because like being a musician, 
my parents they they thought it was like a a dream that maybe you should be a lawyer instead and it was like a it was a fucking nightmare for them you know what i mean so yeah i mean no i kind of joke about it now as i've gotten older um my parents were never and my parents were both teachers um and school sort of took a back seat at a certain age for me just because I think they kind of gave me the option to choose, which is very interesting. And, and, and honestly, I think they probably, I think I was, I, I think I was a force, right? Like, I think that for some reason they looked at me and said, I think this is all this kid's going to do, no matter what we do. Right. And we might as well keep him focused on one thing and, you know, keeping them out of drugs and all that other shit let's be thankful and see what happens and that was kind of how it played out right so you didn't have a backup plan no no that's no. ball those that's balls of steel i mean I, I you know i know a bunch of my music musician friends it was the same way like they had that thing and that's all they wanted and they didn't yeah and so education was, I mean, uh, uh, I know that you're, you're, you're a fucking highly intelligent guy. So you, you kind of read later in life, but as a kid, I always read a bunch of books. So, but I hated, I was terrible in school and I didn't do well, even though I was, I was kind of smart, but it didn't, didn't fucking matter. Cause I didn't care about any of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, I heard somebody, um, God, I just heard an interview where somebody, Oh, um, David Mamet got interviewed i just heard the interview a couple weeks ago last week and he went really hard on um public school teachers he said public school teachers are letting down our country and you know to a certain extent i have to agree with what he was saying and both my parents were teachers i didn't have very good teachers yeah. i never had and obviously part of that is the system, right? The teachers only have so much time in a day. But I also feel like if you're a good teacher, you know how to touch kids in a different way, uh, touch them mentally. Right. I never had that. I never had a, a teacher hand me something that, you know, I got interested in that sort of outweighed the interest that I had in, in the sport. And right. that was kind of it. So, um, but yeah, as you said, I think later on in life, I kind of, I tried to make up for lost time, but there's also a lot of things you can't make up for. You know, the development that you get early on from reading certain things or hearing music. I mean, music, it's also music's a funny thing. Like I didn't really, I didn't really hear music until I, I, I sort of made the NHL and I just got lucky and I had a roommate that liked music, uh, not a roommate, I had a guy that let me live in his garage <laughs> and he liked music and we listened to music on the way to the, to practice. And that's how I learned about music. So I've always been open to things, right. Yeah. They've just come at later stages. Yeah. Um, were you, because you're from Canada, were you an automatically a rush fan? Did you like the band rush? My actually, my parents did listen to lighthouse. Okay. There was a, a Canadian band, like a sort of a seventies, like folk rock, but yeah, Rush was always, you definitely heard. And I, 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 uh, I, I ended up like, I think I, I met the guys later on in life, like life's and Neil. Yeah. Neil, Neil. Yeah. yeah. And like had a couple of nights with him out in Toronto, like later on in life, but yeah, they were always around. They were always around for so, me. It was more, um, Tragically Hip and Our Lady Peace. I mean, Tragically Hip is a band that I think is sort of interwoven into junior hockey in Canada. That's like huh. the that's like the junior hockey anthem. Okay. The, a lot of the hip songs, just because they sang about small town Canada and a lot of the cities, towns that they were singing about were towns that we had played in or we were or you know Sault Ste. Marie was in the league so right. that was kind of that was our band growing up for sure um and a great band just a band that was too Canadian that just sang about Canada too much 
actually uh, when i i uh when i first read your book years ago because uh if you guys uh you want to read a great book about hockey uh sean's book called ice capades is one of the best hockey books i've ever read and i've read most of them um and you know uh, is a uh, the, the in- insight on and to things that i i didn't have insight to just as a ranger fan um yeah. <laughs> so um you guys want to read a great book it, i attested to i read the bronx zoo have you ever read that it's by sparky yeah. lyle yeah and your book they were right there i'm like these are two really great sport books if you ever want to uh read a great book when you first came in the league w- w- before this before that you ever read the book outliers malcolm gladwell uh, you- i've read i've read the e- excerpts that certainly talk about the you know the ten thousand hours and the whole birth date situation right. for hockey players that he used as an example definitely so he also talks about there's only so many players in the league because there's only so many players on a team and to be one you are the elite of the elite and uh i know you've talked about it before you talk about it in your book but when you were 13 were were the scouts and the coaches telling you you have the skill or were you that guy that you fought against the, the people telling you couldn't do it? So the game's gone in phases over the years. And from 19, from 1990 to nine to 2000, the game got really big. It was a, uh, it was a big man's game. You remember like the Legion of doom and yep. Philly with Lindros and LeClaire and Renberg. Um, That was how the NHL was played. So as I got older, you know, 14, 15, when you have your first sort of important draft, which is to the junior ranks, um, ultimately I was going to get passed over and I probably wasn't going to get drafted, but there was one coach who saw me play um, that previous season and he made his mind up that he was going to draft me. Hmm. What ended up happening many years later, not many years, three years later, um, the NHL draft came up and I didn't get drafted. Uh, Again, that's like, we're talking 1998, prime big man game in the NHL. Um, I was a, I was a, a high scorer. I was one of the best players in our junior league. But I also, you know, I kind of got a, I had a huge chip on my shoulder because I was small. And because I had a chip on my shoulder, I sort of got labeled as like a a problem child. You know, I'd never been arrested. I never had a DUI, any of that shit. But I had an attitude. And I had to have an attitude because that was the only way you were going to play. Think of a a Theo Fleury or some of the small guys that broke into the NHL uh, around that time or earlier. So when the draft came up and I didn't get drafted, I can still remember, I I remember I wasn't, I was at a pool party the day of the draft. All my peers are wherever they were, St. Louis for the draft. Um, I'm not even sure I had an agent at that point. I didn't get drafted. I remember I came home and my dad was like, you didn't get drafted. And I still remember to this day, it was not, I wasn't phased whatsoever. Most Kids at that point, I think that would have broke them or crushed them. Um, I didn't give a shit, right? And then I think a month and a half later, I got a call from this guy, Joe McDonnell, who was a a scout for the Detroit Red Wings. He had coached uh, in the OHL previously. He was a scout now. He said, I want you to, uh, we'd like to invite you to training camp. And even at that point, I, I didn't even have a, an invite to a training camp. And I was one of the best junior players in all of Canada. So I don't know, you know, like I, I went to camp and obviously, you know, I, I think I did something that not a lot of people thought I was going to do. I got a contract. I ended up making the team a few years later. So along the way, I always had one person that saw something, gave me that shot. And I took the most of it. That's kind of how it went with me. Yeah. Um, were you already starting to be the character you had created later in your hockey career? or but Because you always played a hard game. Even if you weren't 
weren't chirping anyone. You still played a really hard game and were really fast right from the, you know, from the get go. Yeah. I mean, like, like it's so it's wild, right? Because so if I had a, been a minor hockey player today, like let's say I was 12 years old today, um, I'd have a tough time finding a league to be able to play in because, you know, I used to get the parents on our team and the other teams fighting. I used to have to, they used to have to escort me out of the arena when I was like 12 years old. <laughs> um, now you, you would, you would be labeled a uh, domestic terrorist and I'd get kicked out. I wouldn't be allowed to play hockey. Yeah. Right? right. So, yeah, I, I, you know, but I was always small and yeah. for some reason, that chip just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger from, you know, 10 years old to by the time I was 18 and went to my first NHL training camp, you know, the chip on my shoulder was so big that it sort of just blinded me to the other shit, which I think actually was beneficial. Yeah. Like I think that was the best thing that could have happened to me. You were the punk rock guy in, in the NHL. You were like, so what was your favorite team growing up? Um, I think it was a, a, a toss up between, so my favorite team was the Leafs, but my favorite player was Brett Hall. Okay. So like my first NHL game was a Toronto Maple Leaf game. I remember it was 1992. Um, I had a, a Hall jersey on and I had a sign that said Hall of a shot. So I was a little bit of both, but I was definitely a Leaf fan. Like that's what I grew up watching you know, Bob Cole, Hockey Night in Canada, like, um, you actually, when saw your favorite, your favorite hockey player was, was Hull, you actually went on to join his team and win the Stanley Cup with him your first year in the NHL. Yeah, not only that, he's the guy that I lived in his garage. <laughs> and I, so I love the, I love the champagne story. I, uh, yeah, you know. that, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I remember too, I, um, I had sent, I had sent, back then you would send every, all like big stars had, you could send something to them. Yeah. Like, and they would send you something back signed, right? They had like PO boxes. So I remember I sent something to Holly and I got the uh, card back signed or it was an eight by 10. And then 10 years later, I was 22. I was 12 and then I was 22. And I said, Holly, uh, I said, man, one day in a ride, I was just like, you know, I sent you a, a, an eight by 10 to sign and you signed it, you sent it back. And he was like, I'm not going to try and do Holly's voice, but he was like, I didn't sign that. I fucking, I had a babysitter in St. Louis that I ended up putting through college because for four years, all she did was sign. She knew she had my signature. And that was her, she, that was her job. He paid yeah. her her signature. So it's really man, funny. yeah, it's just wild. It's yeah. wild. I mean, I don't think anyone really has that kind of story. Like, and I was a huge Brett Hall fan. That was the first book that I ever read. He yeah. wrote a book called shooting and smiling, which I ended up finding out he didn't write, you know, <laughs> just all those, all those wild stories, man. Yeah. Do you do all the games you played? Do you remember them like little movies in your head, or is it, or do you because there were so many games, eighty-two games a year is a lot. Like I have gigs, man, where I, I've, I've played, you know, Santiago, Chile, and I, I remember two of them, but I've been there six times. Yeah, you know, and I remember two that stand out. And the other ones I kind of don't remember, but I remember bits and pieces. Are your games like that also? Yeah, I think they're always driven by uh, moments, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's moments in, in random games that I remember, and then there's moments in big games that I remember, but yeah. they're always sort of driven, um, in moments. I mean, I, a bunch flash into my head right away when I, when I think back, like my first NHL game, I can't remember, um, because it, it was just a blur. I can't really remember. I don't remember anything of it, actually. Um, but I can remember a weird, like I, I can remember a game when I was playing in Dallas and me and Steve 
Ott were both in the penalty box at the same time. And I can just remember it like it's yesterday, you know? Right. And I know you remember punching Rob Probert in the face and getting away with it. Yeah, I can remember that because I'll never forget his eyes, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was like black eyes, like a shark, you know? Like, mm. it was the first time I think I realized that there were guys in the big leagues that could hurt you, really hurt you, you yeah. know? Because in junior, yeah, you know, he, he didn't really get hurt. But there were some guys in those early days in the NHL that could hurt you. Um, yeah. I remember the Colt Nor, uh, Todd Fedork fight like it was yesterday. I was on the ice. Um, I mean, fuck, Orzy basically killed him. Killed him. I mean, finished his career, but almost killed him. Yeah. Um, and actually, Orr never played the same after that. Even when yeah, he I think, went to Toronto. I think that, he, yeah, yeah, it did, it did something to him as well. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, um, you're right. I've talked to other, other, you know, I have a couple other uh, hockey buddies, um, Brendan Witt and uh, Daniel Carcillo, and they, they talk about the same thing where they just, you know, that some guys don't recover from stuff like that. But what, what was the best game you ever played? Do you, I know you remember that one. Yeah. You know, the, the, the playoff games, some of those playoff games against Atlanta or, or Jersey were games. I think the best, the best hockey that I ever played, I think, was that, that stretch that we went on when I first got traded to New York and the team was kind of losing. Um, I think we won like 17 out of 20. We went on a real crazy stretch and there was a game in Long Island that we had to win. That was a clinching game for us to make the playoffs. And um, I think I had two goals in that game. And it, it was the first time I played a game that matters where I personally sort of took over a game, right? right? Like kind of, I was the, obviously we had Hank and Hank probably fucking played lights out, but it was, it was the first time I played a game where I, I really, I felt like you could, I could just control anything that was happening. Yeah. Um, I, I remember being at the garden, uh, you know, I was, I toured all the time, but whenever I came home, I tried to catch as many games as I could. And I was there when Avery was being chanted and there was only two guys. They would, they would chant Hank and they would, they would chant you. And um, it was unbelievable, man. I remember it just, it, you, like you were, I mean, it must've been, a, it must've been an awesome feeling to, to have your name chanted at the garden because you were beloved, but on the other end of it, everybody else in fucking hockey fucking hated you. Like you were even, even the fucking Tortorella was giving you shit. And he, he was such a, you, I mean, as a fan, I could tell that he was destroying that team. Yeah, and it was a shame because you guys had definitely you could have went further had he not done what he did to people, including yeah. you, Kreider. I mean, he 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 did it to a number of Gabrick. Um, yeah, yeah. He, uh, you know, I think it's a funny sport, right? Like it's uh, there's so many things that are out of your control, but also in your control, and like a, a, a guy like that, if I owned a billion dollar asset. I would never have the guy running that asset who didn't play the game. Absolutely. Right. You know, like, yeah, it, it, like just that, that just because he doesn't understand. Yeah. And there was always that disconnect with him and ultimately his style doesn't work. It doesn't work in today's game. And it didn't mm -hmm. work back then because that was started. That, that was sort of the, the shift of players understanding, like, um, one, we're, we're more valuable than you, so you can never really pull that shit. Yeah. But, like, I played with, for Scotty Bowman, and Bowman was the master because he never got what he needed out of guys by trying to break them down. He just played psychological warfare with you in the way that he did it, and it always worked. And you right. didn't even sometimes know what was happening. Yeah. Um that's a coach, but Tortorella was a very insecure man who didn't want anyone to have more power than him. 
Absolutely. Um, it was apparent, even as a fan, as a, I know nothing about the inside before I read your book as a fan watching it. And I only like the Rangers. I don't like anyone else. And we, you know, me and my buddies could all see this dude. He's just not working. It's not yeah. working. Yeah. You know? Um, but what was the first, what was the original question? Well, <laughs> I don't remember. Either do I. <laughs> Oh no, the chanting the name. Yeah. Oh, you're chanting your name. You're chanting your name. There you go. Yeah, I think um I don't think I could I, I don't think I was meant or I could play in any other place, right? Because yeah. I think that I I had a connection with New York fans, the hardworking New Yorkers, you know, the old school New Yorker of like um we fucking wear our heart on, on our, on our sleeve and we just sort of lay it out there and we don't like any bullshit. And I yeah. think, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. It was, you know, for years that was, the, it was Hank or it was, it was Hank a lot. Um, right. but it was also me and that, that was, yeah. I mean, dude, that's the, that's the greatest arena in the world. That's the great, that's the best organization to play for. Everybody wants to play there. Um, it's special. It's hard. It sucks, man. It's like, fuck, New York was such a great city. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, you know, it'll, it'll get back there at some point, I hope, but, but um, really sports is the only thing that I think has kept its soul there, you know? Yeah. Um... With, with fans and the, and the city and, and without all the other bullshit. Yeah, it seems to. I was in New York recently, and uh, I went to a comedy show, and um, that was, you know, comedy's thriving only because it's a basement kind of deal, and and music is is not doing well because nobody yeah. was touring. I mean, everyone's trying to catch up for the last two years, and uh, myself included, and and so we're planning for twenty twenty three. We're not even looking at the rest of this year. So, right, um, uh, you know, uh, but I. I, you know, I watch all the hockey games. It's the one thing I got at, you know, at home to, you know, but I'm out in Phoenix, but, uh, you, I know you left New York. You're, you're in California now. Yeah. Hopefully not for that long, but, um, yeah, that, that was the kind of the move. I think I needed to, we needed to get out of New York and I needed to come out here for, for, to grind out here a little bit, hopefully for, like I said, not long. I think if I'm here, if I'm here for if I'm here in two years, I'm not doing something right. I don't think right. we will be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's you know, it's it's crazy. It's it's like that's the other thing. Where do you live now? You know, I, I think I've been very outspoken about the last couple of years and the shit that that's gone on. And now being a dad, like it, all those decisions, you know phoenix arizona you know hopefully arizona gets its shit sorted out but i could see myself that could be a i could live there you know i never yeah. thought i could live somewhere quiet but i just want to live somewhere that has a good community and like you know people are are friendly and they take care of the kids and it's safe you yeah. know i live in, i live in chandler arizona you know uh i left new york in in 2014 and I've been here in Chandler, man. It's quiet. It's nice. You know, um, I, I travel still, I go to LA and New York and, and, um, but when I go to the city, I went to uh, LA a month ago. Um, and it was a fucking nightmare. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a, it, it, it was like, a the, the tents, I mean, in my hotel, when we, I got the hotel, there were tents in the parking lot and I, yeah. and I, I just went to another hotel. I'm like, I'm not staying here. Get the fuck out yeah. of here. Um, and New York yeah. was, New York was a little, it was, it was, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but the business wise, like I felt bad for the bartenders and the waitresses and the, and the people that really make the city work and run. A lot of them were gone. They you know, like a lot of people, a lot of my friends have left LA, a lot of friends have left New York um, for other parts of the country. Cause they just, uh, you know, and I love New York, man. I, and I grew up there. I, I loved it. I, I know. I think it, you know, I think people, uh, the good thing is, is that at least we're, we have the ability to change it all by, you know, by making certain decisions. 
Well, we'll I love see. your podcast. You have a podcast called No Gruffs Given. I'm gonna, Thanks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I, every time you put a post out, I repost it. I, I, I love your, uh, your conversation with people, and uh, you know, you're an actor. Yeah, uh, Peter Berg is one of my favorite directors. And when I yeah. saw you, I saw you in Mile Twenty Two. I was like, fuck yeah. Um, um, Patriots Day, I, it went by quick. I, I didn't, I saw it, but I don't remember it. But either, either do I. That was the first one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Pete, Pete, I've known for a long time. Uh, he put me in Patriots Day. That was sort of my first. That was really the first time I had ever been on a movie set, and I don't know, something just, something just hooked me, and it's kind of what I've been doing for the last like six years. Is just sort of uh that whole malcolm gladwell thing as well like getting my ten thousand hours right yeah, trying yeah. to trying to figure out how to do this and um i'm ready now you know so i think it's it's and the good thing about this and i don't know i've always had a good intuition on like uh understanding reality and what is the reality of like can i really do this right um and I think that, you know, one, I know that I can now, but the other really interesting thing is I could do this for the next 40 years, yeah. you know, uh, whereas my previous, my previous life or, or job, you have such a small window when you think about the scope of life, right? Like yeah. 15 years from 20 to 35, it goes by like that, you know, yeah. it's, it's so fast um so it's it's i i really i feel like i'm lucky that i had the sport thing first and i and i did that and now i feel like i'm sort of getting close to settling into something that's wildly different but also very similar in a lot of senses um fulfilling for me and also fun like yeah. very fun very challenging we, honestly, man, you were a great writer too. I mean, your story was captivating for, for anyone I handed the book to, or I told the book, there's like, that was a great fucking book. It was a, a you know, you were, you, you were super fucking honest about, yeah, you, well, you, you, you know, and that's the key to, I think the key to you, you played an honest game. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. You, all the other teams hated you, but you're on my team. So I didn't give a fuck. I fucking loved you. Cause you were, yeah, I think you that, played honest that, and hard. That's the, uh, that was it. Like, uh, and even I remember writing the, the process, like once I, once I started writing um, and, you know, we ended up, I ended up, I, I had a partner writing with me, uh, Michael, but Michael didn't really come in till the end. Like I, I spent a year just writing. And if you're being honest, it's kind of hard to, to fuck anything up. I mean, it, it is, <laughs> it is what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we figured out how to kind of formulate the story and put it together. But really, it was just a chronological journey, like point yeah. A to point B. This is where it started and this is where it ended. And this is how I felt along the way. Yeah. Uh, and, and guys write these books and they they fucking they don't tell the truth. You know what I mean? Whether they I don't do. they, they tell the truth, but they don't tell they don't tell the hard truth. The yeah. hard truth. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, read, I read a couple of musician books, and I'm like, Dad, I was there. That's not the way that went down. You know what right. I mean? So, yeah. but uh, um, who is the who is the the hardest hitting player you ever played against? <laughs> it's probably not what everyone's going to expect, but there was this uh, small defenseman had a good career, played a long time. His name was Stefan Robida. Okay. He, he played in uh, Dallas, primarily in Dallas. Uh, he was a little French guy that just something about him. I, I think when I think about it now, it's we were, per, we were very similar in size. And the science of like body checking, although it's sort of a lost art, it's all about levels and point of impact. And I think because me and him were the exact same size, same build whenever he hit me it felt like i got hit by a fucking truck you know <laughs> versus when you get if you hit a if a bigger guy hits you or you hit a bigger guy um 
it's not that like perfect synergy of shoulder on shoulder. There's always sort of, you know, yeah. I, hitting Zdeno Ochara or Hal Gill. Like I'm hitting him in, with my shoulder and I'm hitting him in the stomach, right? <laughs> right. But yeah, Stefan Robidoux was a guy that he, he hit like a fucking truck. Um, do you think that the, I know that, that fighting isn't the main cause of, of, um, head trauma in hockey. I know that, do you, can you talk about how the gear changed? Because I know that the, between the shoulder pads, the elbow pads, that, that really, and the speed of the game is really what started causing a lot of the, the major industry, uh, in, uh injuries rather than fighting. Cause fighting is kind of nil when it comes to that. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's, it's that exactly. It's the evolution of the game as far as equipment. Um, the equipment is so well made and so light and gives guys the ability to move faster, um, to train better. Uh, and that's really, I think, what it comes down to. It's the evolution of the game. It's the evolution of players, their physicality, how strong they are, how healthy they, they are. Um, and then that equals speed. And that speed is what you see happening, right? Like, uh, and the, the leagues tried to do things and they're trying to do things to eliminate it as much as possible. But guys got big and got strong very quickly. Yeah. In, a, in, a, in a 10-year period, it went from, you know, going to training camp to get into shape to going to training camp in the best shape that you're ever going to be in. Yeah. Yeah. I remember guys would come in, some guys would be like 10 pounds overweight. They'd spent the whole summer partying. And then there were guys that showed up like ready to go. And that did change. I remember hearing stories. People would smoke in a locker room in between periods, like even like the big old school players. Um, but which yep. is amazing to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, those early days, like, uh, well, the modern day NHL player now, you, their their off ice habits are nothing to what the older guys were like. You know, even when I was playing, like yeah. they don't drink, they don't they don't party. Uh, maybe you know a few times a season they'll let yeah. it rip, but it's not the you know every night sort of. I mean, that was the other thing about me when I played in New York. New York was still thriving you know one night like sunday night i'd be at a show at the bowery or webster hall who knows what and then you know every night of the week there was something to do that city was fucking alive yeah man, and we went awesome. we went we went hard and it was kind of part of our sort of the makeup of the team we had a lot of guys that that did the same thing now it's it's more scientific you know these guys yeah, are all it's all stats and, and there's you know there's a lot of money at stake so i don't blame them um right. but you know I, I i think a little bit of the both will never hurt you yeah well i know that so you know knowing your book and i know you know the ins and outs i you know i know new york the same way even though um i don't drink but i did go hang out with a lot of people and uh knew uh, of all those spots um but you talked about in your book, you talked about eating acid and uh, at a fish show. Yeah. And this is why you were a player. This is like in your see you're off season, but you you smoked weed and you uh, you you lived life fucking like a fucking rock star, even though you were a hockey player. Yeah. And, uh, and um, it never affected your game which I don't like, I saw guys that did it. And then you like, like, you know, I'm glad Jordan Tutu is sober now, but for a while yeah. he was a fucking mess, but you yeah. just seem how to keep it all together. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's funny, like I haven't, I haven't had a drink in probably eight years. Um, and it wasn't, I, I stopped drinking because when I stopped playing, I didn't want those extra calories. I was like, I got to chew. I got to, I got to prioritize shit now because i'm not playing so i just stopped drinking but um yeah no we went hard we went hard you know what, what what's funny is up until i think uh i was 20 
my first year of pro, I was laser focused. Like in high school, didn't drink, never smoked pot, like didn't hang out with those kids, that whole thing. Um, and then I kind of, I don't know, I, I, I started to listen to music and everything. I started to catch up on things and it just changed. And then I, you know, I was always up for an experiment. Um, that acid trip was, it's funny because you can go and see, uh, Fish was playing Saratoga. It was, uh, it was, I think, August of 2009. And they did a 26 minute version of uh, Katy Perry's I Kissed a Girl. And at like the 16 minute mark, the acid started to hit me. And it was the first time I had ever tripped. And the fucking song was just, just grating. It was like the worst song I had ever heard and they had ever played. And it just wouldn't stop. And it just took me into a, fuck, it took me into a real hole. Right. Uh, I, I got out of it. You know, I got out of it. I made it home, the whole thing. But um, yeah, you know, the off seasons were fun because that's what it was all about. You work hard and like, we're young. Let's have fun. Let's, let's, let's see the country and go to, you know, I went to Glastonbury and did all like the festival circuit. And I'm glad I did. You right. know what I mean? But I always, I always worked like Monday to Friday dialed in. Like I right. got to get what I got to get done and then, and then we can let loose. Yeah. How many countries have you been to? Do you, do you remember or do you have an idea? Um, been to a lot of Radiohead shows. I've probably seen Radiohead like 35, 40 times, I think. Yeah. Um, when, you know, they don't tour that much. So I've seen them a lot. Uh, I've seen a lot of fish shows. Uh, now I got a kid now. So like, and <laughs> fuck, I, I don't even know. You have to like sell your soul to go to a concert now. But yeah, yeah. I used to go to a lot of shows all summer long. I'd go to shows, you know, yeah. four or five festivals in off season. Uh, we used to go to Bonnaroo every year. That was our big, that was our big American festival. Yeah. Me and you were, we were at Coachella the same year. You were there. On. I was there. Yeah, I was there early on. Yeah. Early on. That's when it was still good. You I know? did the first five. I was there for the first five. Yeah. You remember like that? That was like was the glory days, man. The glory no days, was, man. It was the no best. one was out there. Everyone like one <laughs> VIP area. Everyone was hanging yep. out. Yeah. Now I, it's a fucking circus. It's not. I don't even go. It's like yeah. I don't even want to. I don't want, and plus, if I saw the band list, I was like, I don't even. I know two bands on here. Run the jewels and somebody else. I'm like, I I don't want to go to that. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I saw I saw Madonna in the little tent. Like Madonna played a tent with, you know, 20,000 people inside the tent. And it was, it was pretty awesome, man. That was great. So you know? That was when she did her like disco, her like yeah. first electronic thing. Yeah. 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 It was her. Yeah. And, and I, when I ran over to see Streps Armstrong and then I ran to see Phantomas and, and uh, yeah, man. So let's talk music, man. So uh, we're both big Radiohead fans. Radiohead's one of my favorites. Um, um, but I'm also like, I know that so I'm a, a thrash metal singer and my music is extremely heavy and, and, but that's not what I listen to. And I, I know that my, my fans always get mad. They don't get mad, but they're like, give me shit about it. But my favorite band is queen. Um, yeah. and, uh, Freddie Mercury is my favorite singer, but, uh, Radiohead and then, uh, um, and talk about other bands that you love that you, uh, Oh, uh that you uh love yeah i mean i it's funny like uh when i first got to la um matthias nordstrom who was our captain on the kings yeah he was a big metal he's a big metal fan and he took me to my first uh system of a down show yeah and I think it was at the will turn or i don't know so i can't remember where it was and like i met you know i, I met the guys in the band surge and like um that was kind of i i went through sort of a 
uh, I, I wouldn't say, I think kind of at that point, like we're talking 2006, yeah. LA had sort of a vibe, like a, there was there was also, I mean, System of a Down was big, R Rage was still. Yeah, they maybe, were going. They were yeah. still going, like there was still, that was still happening out here. Yeah. Um, and then when I got to New York, it's funny how it goes in sort of phases. I think like, I think I saw Radiohead for the first time. And then I saw this band, uh, Seeger Ross, um, this Icelandic band, like they're kind of uh, instrumental, but they sing in a made up language. Hmm. Uh, I got heavy into them. Uh, then somebody took me to a fish show and the first time I went to a fish show was the first time I had ever got dosed with like MDMA and I was fucking, I was just hooked on the whole fish ride. Yeah. Um, and then I went through a little bit of a dead phase when I mean, a couple of years ago with mayor and went, I, I've always been all over the place. Like, yeah, I like good. I like live shows. I like good live shows. Yeah. I like, I like live music that, um, with great musicians and yeah. I like, and I, and I like showmen, you know, yeah. like if I can go see Pearl Jam, uh, I'll always go to a Pearl Jam show, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get in the car and I'll do what I got to do to go see, go see Eddie. Cause he's fucking a showman, you know? Yeah. Um, it sucks because this this fucking pandemic has sort of taken the 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 love out of it, you know. Um, and yeah. I, I and it, maybe maybe it's coming back. I just haven't I haven't stepped back into it yet to experience it. Yeah. Because um, no one's really got me out of my seat too. Because I also think music sort of sucks right now. Well, I know uh, that you you and I have a thing in common. Where when you were, I remember you in your book you talk about you would just put on a record, light a couple candles and shut the world out. And yeah. I, um, I've been known to shut off every light in my house, put on my headphones and, and just listen to music. Uh, I yeah. do that with, I do that with uh, the band tool. I, I really like them a lot. Um, yeah, I'm a big but, tool. I'm a big tool fan. I'm yeah. a big tool fan. I, yeah. uh, Miles Davis and John Coltrane. I'll go through jazz for a while and then I'll go, you know, and then I'll slip to old ACDC and then I'll, I'll go to rush for, I, I saw a thing on rush recently. So I listened to every album that I love for like a week and I just got, and I just do that. But I, you know, even to this day, like I, I still buy vinyl and I buy records and I open up and I read the lyrics and I, and, and, and uh, music has always been that thing for me that, that you had with hockey. It was that, that, that i needed it you know um, right yeah i mean i i i think what's uh i don't know if you know i it's funny because like did you see that a star is born with bradley cooper and, and lady not. gaga i did not so i don't know you know musicians might go oh my god what a but i thought there was something really amazing about Bradley Cooper playing that role and doing it with sort of a superstar like Lady Gaga from a music standpoint. Mm. Um, and then they, they, they made it into a movie, but also the songs are freestanding and, and I could listen to them and I like them. I, there's something interesting, like, I don't, I'm not close to it yet, but I would love to play a musician at some point. I think it would be so freeing. There'd be yeah. something like, fuck, so awesome about it. And having to actually, you know, learn how to do it, which is a whole other thing. You might but, play it, Blake. You're talking about playing like a singer in a movie. Yeah. 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 Huh. You know, All right. You I can know? see that. Um, I, I think the, the beautiful thing is, is like, one, if you have enough time, the movies can make you look like you, you can do anything right yeah but they're always character driven and musicians are characters and you know i think that's what's cool about the whole idea but i i'll tell you like i i haven't i need to reconnect with with a band something 
that's sort of like, and I need more music around in, in our in our house because I think it does something just for your soul, your energy. You know what I mean? We're yeah. so so many podcasts, podcasts are the thing now, and that's sort of you know this whole spoken word and hearing people. It's cool. It's great because I think it's going to save our country, yeah. but also you know, putting a record on and, and putting it in your ears and just like letting time go by. I think yeah. everyone needs to do that again a little bit more. So I'm, I'm coming out to LA to go see uh, Dave Chappelle's. Uh, he's doing his next Netflix special at the Hollywood Bowl. And I'm going to do a podcast with a, with a, a buddy of mine, a stand-up comedian, and we're going to smoke cigars and we're going to sit in his yard out by the beach and we're going to, and chill. And I know that at some point, like when I, when I, I always go and I try to make a point of watching the, the sun go down at the beach and play some music and that thing, it always kind of like recenters us. And yeah. I don't know if it does it for everybody, but I know that it, that that's how music has always been for me. Now, yeah. my, own, my own music is insane. Like my own music is, 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 is dark. And, and I, I sing about all, all everything fucked up in the world. I don't really have many, uh, I don't have any happy songs. Everything's right. uh, um, uh, maybe as when I get, when I get older, I might write one, but I haven't yet. So, but you know, what's interesting, like that was sort of when, uh, cause we play music before games and I always tried to play I always tried to play Radiohead. I always tried to play Tool, and guys didn't want to hear it. They you know, yeah. they they want they want the it was it was a big electronic like the whole fucking DJ thing and like Swedish House Mafia and let's get pumped up on that. And it never <laughs> worked for me. It never yeah. worked for me. Yeah. Um, but I like depressing music. Depressing music makes me happy. Yeah, it does for me too. Yeah. Yeah the darker stuff and uh, uh um i know that when when i listen to music especially like before we'd go on stage i remember like i would be listening to like uh nwa like right before we walked on because it made me want to punch somebody in the face and that's yeah. what my band was about my band was i remember i told my guitar player i, I want to be the fucking sean avery of metal i want people to fucking either hate me or love me whatever i don't give a fuck but they're gonna feel something when they leave yeah and, um i've made uh i've had so i was in philly one night you guys were playing the the, the you're playing the fucking philadelphia flyers it right. was the night that carcillo beat up gabrick yeah you were on the ice and i fucking was in a bar watching the fucking game with my avery jersey on and then i had to go play philly that night with my i, I kept my jersey on and my guitar player had his fucking uh, Philly jersey on and guys were spitting on me and throwing shit at me. And I was like, fuck you, yeah. fuck your flyers. You've, and I just, and I, I did that stuff. And I, I was like, I want to be, I remember my guitar player, you want to be the Sean Avery of fucking hockey? I go, yeah, man, he's fucking, he's the shit. You were, you were so fucking on Here I am fanboying again, but you were, I, you were, uh, you were the ultimate hockey player. I think that I think that what you can definitely you never knew what you were gonna get, right? Like uh could have been a Tuesday night in February. Um you never knew what I was gonna do. And yeah. I think that that's sort of and you know, my own team as well. Yeah. But that's exciting, right? Yeah. Like you know, that's what we're in the entertainment business. Like, let's fucking give people a show. Let's entertain. Let's, yeah. let's, you know, I, I, I respect, I respect people, hardworking people now today more than ever. Like you, you pay that money to go and see something, whether it's a show, a concert or a game or fuck, like do it the right way. You yeah. know, like, that that's what life's all about that's why yeah. we work and get up every day yeah so that was kind of always i i understand what you're saying i get it i get yeah. it i told i told bands i i, I would 
I would do like you did the other players. I'd be like, you bet if you were going in after us, I'd be like, you better bring your fucking a game. Cause I'm going to crush these people tonight and you're going to have to go on after me. So yeah. enjoy that. And I ruined a bunch of people's nights by saying that, like just rattling them. And, but you know, it was all in, all in good fun. No, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. That's part yeah. of it. Yeah. Also that's like that there's something self-motivating about that as well. that I don't think people understand because yeah. <clears throat> when you say that when you exude that energy you gotta back it up uh, you, you know yeah well you also you you played you always knew like the, the the thing that i love about uh you know pro sports guys is that is they're risking it all for the off chance that you take a puck to the fucking side of the head like zuccarello did in the playoffs and then you're you're out and you're done. And, and luckily he came back, but a lot of guys, man, I mean, you, that could have been, your career could have been over that then that day. Now you got, you played every shift like it was your last one. Cause you, you talk about, it. you knew that that was an option of, of things going out. Now, does the NHL help you after? Um, I mean, I'll say this, we have best, we have probably the best health insurance out of all the big sports leagues, but no, not really, not, not, not really, you know? So, uh, so like uh, in situations like, uh, I mean, um, I love Derek Bugard and I, I know you did too. And I, I know the story and, and uh, the, the fans, you, you, if you read Sean's book, there's a really good section on, on Derek and um he was you know, a kind of a norm nowadays. I mean, uh, Kevin Hayes' brother just uh, kind of went through the same thing. Yeah. And so now, when guys get hurt in the in the in the league, do you think the league is in, in like looking for their best interest, or are they only is it or is it just or is it the money and the and the and winning is the only thing, and the player is just like a like a number. Well, like, I, I, I think, here's what I think. I don't think that this is specific to NHL, NFL, NBA, MLB. Right, right. Yeah. I, I think that, I, honestly, I think the responsibility always lies on the um, coach, general manager, you know, the two, the two but also the player, right? So at a certain point, the player isn't handling it well. The player's kind of gone in the, in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. At that point, that's when a coach has to step in and take care of his players. That, that, that's my belief, right? Um, I think the NHL has systems that are in place that are actually much more lenient and welcoming than some of the other leagues. Okay. So like, you can step forward and say, Hey, I got a problem and you're not going to lose your fucking, you're not going to get suspended. You're not going right. to, you know, you, you're going to be able to get a second chance. Do your teammates um, help along too? Do are teammates or is it? Absolutely. That... Totally. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean the Bugard situation I, and I talk about it um, in my opinion, Derek Bugard, Tortorella was a big part of Derek Bugard's demise. Yes. Um I don't think Tortorella knew where it was going to end. Uh, and I think that that's his fault that he didn't think about that, but uh, he was trying to just, he, he was trying to service himself in the moment for the team. It was the wrong decision. And it was a big part of Derek and Derek had issues, but Derek didn't have, he wasn't supported. He was alienated. He was actually fucking ostracized and like shut out so when he was separated from the team was that tortorella's rule only or the nhl's rule no that was tortorella yeah no yeah, that that sucks and that that's killed a, him that's an awful story yeah yeah because yeah. when you're hurt I mean, you need your you, when you're hurt you need your your boys around you you know a that, band is the same way i mean i mean i've been in a band and a, you know when when somebody was struggling with addiction land we all kind of like hey man and you know you kind of let it go for a while and you see if they can pick their own self up but yeah. i've been sober 29 years so I, I toured for 10 years on a tour bus completely sober watching people <laughs> fucking you know live to every excess there is and then when the, when the time came they 
they uh they asked for help and we were there that's the way yeah. it is you know yeah and so, that that that's the thing that we weren't even given an option to be there for him right that sucks because we didn't know where he was because he wasn't allowed to be around us yeah it, 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 it was a. Uh, you know, whatever you want to say about my relationship with him, I saw what he did to, to Bugard. I saw, yeah. I was there. I mean, I, you, you can never tell me that I don't know what right. I'm fucking, I was there and I saw it. Yeah. And it was one of the worst things I've seen in sports in in my run in pr professional sports. Right. Bad stuff, bad stuff, man. When, um, and you know you you could you saw it. I mean, I we were in, myself and uh, Aaron Voros were I think the first two people that went into his apartment in New York because he died in in Minnesota, I, I think. Yeah, Minnesota. And his apartment looked like an apartment that somebody that was you know told to stay away. It it, it was like out of a movie. Yeah. The drapes fucking pulled shut and wine bottles everywhere you could fucking i mean it was a terrible scene man and, and uh, it started with a it started with a with a um with a concussion yeah 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 and yeah. you know so um fuck bad shit bad yeah, shit man. bad shit but yeah. I, I don't think that's a rampant thing you know i think that that was I think that was that coach is the one that did that. Yeah. Well, he was all he was such a dick to so many people. Gabrick, I know Gabrick fucking hated him. Yeah. Um, I know nothing, nothing made me happier than watch Kreider score the hat trick when he came back as the Columbus coach. Yeah. And that smirk that he gave him as he skated by the bench, you know. Yeah. Um, I love the yeah, story. What a, you what a, what a year Kreider's having too. Boy. Oh, dude, man. Fuck yeah. The uh I love when the story you telling him just dude shut the fuck up on the bench yeah. and he actually just shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh you know I heard that uh uh who was the coach that won the cup with the Rangers? Uh Keenan was the same yeah. way. He was kind of the same way the guys had just enough of his shit and uh Messier kind of had to put him in his place, but I think um Tony Amati told a story that he um that Adam Graves beat the shit out of somebody in front of the bench and looked at the coach and said, you're next. Uh, but I, you know, I think that at least with Keenan, I think Keenan respected that. Yeah. I think that was Keenan. George wouldn't have. No, no, no. he would have, he would have, he would have done everything in his power to get rid of you at that point. Yeah. He was like a, like a dictator, you know, yeah. you can't, ch you can't challenge the dictator where a guy like Keenan I know Keenan, all Keenan was doing was trying to get his guys, get the most out of them. And right. he didn't care if they hated him. Okay. He didn't care. And he didn't hold it against them. You know what I mean? That's what he was wanting to do. Because right. that's how he felt he was going to get the most out of the group. Right or wrong. Yeah. But um, he wasn't a bad person. You yeah. know, and that's that's the difference. When um when you left the team, uh, there's two things I, I want to say real quick. The the when you the smile that you give when Anisimov did the whole <laughs> the, gun, the smile you walk in, you give him is fucking classic. That's one of my favorites. The, that that little because yeah. I knew I was like, oh, that's fucking awesome. And then um, and then your last game, you didn't know it was your last game, right? And you didn't go to the Islanders. I, I don't. I was. I thought that maybe you would because I knew you wanted to stay in New York, but I was like, yeah. I hope I, I wanted to see you play more. I just didn't want to see you in, in my division. I wanted to see you on the West. So. Yeah. But um, your last game, do you remember it? No. Who was against Montreal? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Cause I know you went to the minors, you played and then you came back when they needed you again. And then the, was it the outdoor Philly game? No, I think it was before that. And I think it was like a Montreal game. And I think I scored and played a pretty good game, but it was just the writing was on the wall. Like the moment that he could, he, it, it took him four years to get, get rid of me. And he finally yeah. had the opportunity at that point. Yeah. 
But no, that I don't sucks. remember my I don't remember my last game. How old were you? Uh I think I was 34, maybe. So you were in the prime of your hockey career that you you were between I think 31, 36 is like when you are the when you are laser focused on being that's when you're the your body's physically the strongest and you can go ahead and and you were a fucking wrecking ball and you were they I you know I wish yeah I, I know I, you got I, the cup. I I wish like I wish you had gotten the chance, but I I felt bad for you when you when you left because I was like I, I'm not done watching him because he's awesome. Here's the here's the beautiful thing is that like um everything happens for a reason, right? Like I'm a firm believer of that. And I couldn't be happier and I couldn't be more excited to today about the future and like the opportunities that I that I'm that I'm ready for. And that's yeah. fucking and, you know, and I guess part of that, I'm lucky that I'm in that spot because a lot of guys that played aren't in that spot. But I'm thankful. I, I'm so thankful because, like, I, I'm about to go on a run and, and fucking do this whole other thing. And it's, it's great. It's like this is what life, you know, this is what life is all about. You have opportunities and you get to, to work hard and fulfilling for yourself that's yeah. that's what i'm that's what i'm feeling right now and you know it's all good i love well, i'm it. i'm looking forward to reading the book about your acting career you know what i mean so sean Me I, before we before i let you go i'm gonna let you go for your run um you know when you did the marriage equality statement in your time in the rangers and then you you opened a gateway that hadn't been opened before and you kind of i think personally i think you put a stop to that um that you started that the change in the dynamic that was going on in the culture and, yeah um, I, so I, I thank you for that and um you know you also you know you were honest your whole career and i i you you were an awesome player and and i thought you brought a a good thing to the game and uh and you were the king of shit talk. That's for sure. I thought you were the the most hated guy in hockey, but then I realized Bettman is is up there above you. So, but <laughs> that guy, nobody hates that guy more than NHL fans. It's fucking crazy. But uh, anyway, no. Listen, I I appreciate that, and um, we got to link up at some point. Yeah. You know? Before you go, I'm going to ask you your 10 favorite songs. Songs that, so I have a list of 10 songs that, that changed my life. I, if somebody asked me, I could go through the list. Songs that, that jumped out and they either, they either change your life or the, you just, it's a song that you keep going back to because it brings comfort like a, like a yeah. cigarette, you know? Yeah, so. I would say uh, Pearl Jam, Better Man, um, Tragically Hip, Bob Cajun. Um, uh bradley cooper lady gaga shallow uh vicarious tool um Ooh. um fuck uh 15 steps radiohead uh oh shit down with the disease fish um Man, there was this Eminem song uh, that I listened to when I got suspended in Dallas and I was back in New York waiting to come back to play for the Rangers. And I used to run the, uh, the I used to run Central Park to stay in shape. Fuck, what was it called? God damn it. Oh, I can't remember. Um, man, what else? shit oh i i would say what neil young song uh maybe helpless uh crosby stills nash and young uh teach your children and um fuck one other let me give you one more let me give you one more 
Um, fuck, I don't know. I don't know. That's all I got. Uh, I'm going to put a Black Sabbath one in there for you. Okay, because... what? <laughs> uh, into the Void. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, <laughs> or a system of down. I'll, I'll add a. So I usually add a, a couple of them. You know what I mean? To, um, but I'll. What'll happen is at the end there'll be a Spotify, and it'll be Sean Avery's Spotify list, and it'll be linked on the page and all that. Okay, stuff. you you, you filled know. out fill out the rest. Okay, I will. Sean, well, we'll link up at some point. I'd love to sit yes, down, bro. have a have a coffee and dinner with you, and uh, and uh, yeah, and thank you so much for doing this, man. I can't thank you enough. It's uh, dude, I I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, we'll I'll see you soon for sure. Yeah.